Welcome to the Brazil Seminar. This series of lectures are part of the Political, Social and Economic Development in Brazil course offered by the School of International Public Affairs with support from the Institute of Latin American Studies and the Lehman Center for Brazilian Studies at Columbia University. Over the years, we have had speakers from a broad range of areas, including leading academics, current and former senior government officials, representatives of international organizations, and Wall Street analysts, among other distinguished guests. Even though the discussions are tailored to graduate students in international affairs, public policy, and Latin American studies, the lectures should be accessible to anyone interested in Brazil. Following a tradition set forth by Professor Albert Fischlo, who launched the Brazil Seminar almost 20 years ago, we aim to continue offering a unique academic experience to students while enabling the participation of the community now with the use of new technologies. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the session. You're muted, Professor. Thanks, Anna. All right. So thanks so much, and everyone. And uh, I'm just getting used to the virtual environment again. So bear with me. This is the first class of the semester. And uh, we are back in the metaverse. To kick off our activities, we are very pleased to have a very special guest uh, to discuss issues that uh, you've seen on the press and that they were published, published by one of the most influential media vehicles uh, in, among decision makers. And uh, so let me share a little bit uh, our slides before introducing our speaker today. And I hope that uh, you are all having a great semester, especially the students who are joining this class. Sarah Esther Maisling joined The Economist in 2017. In 2018, she moved to Sao Paulo to become The Economist's Brazil correspondent. Previously, she was a freelance journalist based in Central America. Her reporting has appeared in The Washington Post, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The Nation, Vice Magazine, Columbia Journalism Review, and other publications. She's the recipient of an MHP Gold Award for Foreign Reporting, a Mirror Award for Media Reporting, a Norman Mailer Writing Award, and a Carrie Logan Nonfiction Writing Residency. She graduated from Yale University with a degree in history. Sarah is speaking from Sao Paulo, and it's a very it's a great pleasure to have her joining us. Uh, that's one of the benefits of being, doing these virtual, virtual sessions that we can, uh, we, we can connect with our speakers, even if they are not here in New York. Sarah, welcome. And it's a great pleasure to have you here in our virtual classroom. Uh, we, apart from the students who are enjoying this, who are joining us on this course, we have also an external audience that will be with us for the first part of the session. Uh, just reminding everyone that uh, after Sarah's presentation and a couple of, uh, of questions, we will have a Q&A that is going to be private for the students so they can have a more uh, 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 an open discussion with, uh, with everyone in the classroom. Right? So Sarah, without further ado, let me hand over the words uh, and the, the stage to you. Hi, um, thank you so much, Sydney. It's really good to be here. Um, I appreciate the invitation and it's, uh, it's nice to see all of you. Um, it's sort of hot and muggy here in Brazil. Uh, you might get some sounds of a thunderstorm in a little while. Um, so Brazil, the title of this talk uh, is, is Brazil on the brink? And that of course is, from the special report that we did uh, at The Economist, that I did at The Economist uh, last year. And 
um, I mean, I guess to put forward this question, is Brazil on the brink? What comes to mind is, you know, is Brazil on the brink? And on what brink? What is the brink? Um, I mean, I guess I would first answer that question with, uh, with a caveat, which is that this is one of two titles that we put on that special report. The other title was Brazil's Disastrous Decade. And the special report really tried to show how this kind of decade that Brazil has been through, which included a, the worst economic recession, a massive corruption scandal, and a pandemic that hit extremely hard, both in terms of the, the death toll and the economic consequences. But to show how this, you know, it was really the product of a, a, a malaise that started long before the presidency of Jair Bolsonaro, even though we argued that he has exacerbated it in, in almost every way. Um, but then, you know, you have, is Brazil on the brink? So let's kind of get right to it. And uh, this report, of course, was, was published in June. So seven months have passed since then. So I think there's kind of two questions. One of them is, you know, was Brazil on the brink seven months ago? And another one is, is Brazil still on the brink now? And so I wanted to sort of go over a few moments from the past seven months, things that have happened here in Brazil that can help us think about that question looking forward in this year, in 2022, and to, you know, the next decade that Brazil is going to face. The first moment happened on Monday uh, with the death of a man named Olavo de Carvalho, who you may or may not have heard of. He is a Brazilian self-declared philosopher, uh, the author of best-selling books, a um, far-right conspiracy theorist, a YouTube star whose lectures about cultural Marxism inspired tens of thousands of young Brazilian conservatives and a kind of guru to the current president, Bolsonaro, Jair Bolsonaro, who believes in many of the things that he talks about, you know, including most recently that COVID is, you know, either doesn't exist or is way over exaggerated and lots of other kind of crazier things that I invite you to go into the rabbit hole on your own time about. Um, so Olavo de Carvalho died. Bolsonaro declared a day of mourning to, to this man. Uh, and this was really a kind of a moment for, for journalists and Brazilians in general to reflect on kind of the bizarreness of, of this presidency. We've all really normalized it over the past three years. Bolsonaro has become the president, you know, much in the way that the Trump presidency seemed strange at first, but what used to seem strange and crazy kind of got to become just the 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 normalcy of of what we were living through. Um, but I think that this, you know, this sort of death of Olavo de Carvalho was a moment for many people to think, well, what what has changed since 2018? Um, and I think one important thing, and, I, and I'll talk about this kind of going through the rest of these moments, is that it does kind of feel now for the first time that there is a possibility, a strong possibility that you know, this will be the only term of Bolsonaro. And so people are starting to think a bit about his legacy and what his presidency means for Brazil um, going forward. I guess the next thing that I would mention happened in December, and it is very boring. It's a constitutional amendment that was passed that allowed uh, Brazil to sub sort of subvert or sidestep a constitutional spending cap. Um, and that created fiscal room for Brazil to spend money on a social program, which is both very necessary because Brazil has had a really rough economy and if inflation is very high now, it's 10%, almost you know, one of the worst inflation rates in the world. Uh, but it also is, you know, was very clearly a way for Bolsonaro to try to um, ramp up his support in the lead up to an election in October. And so you know, with Congress's blessing and I guess, um, you know, sort of the blessing of the economist, economy minister, Paulo Guedes, who has basically become powerless. Uh, they changed the constitution to allow Brazil to you know, spend more than they're supposed to, which has put a lot of people 
um, kind of made investors very nervous about what happens now, not just this year because of the uncertainty of the election, but also in the coming years because Brazil um, has been sort of running on empty, hasn't been growing, hasn't done the reforms that it needs to do to kind of boost the uh, economy and start to address some of the economic inequality issues that Brazil is facing, you know, just like the US and, and many other countries. Um, and so I guess on, on that note, with this you know, thought that right now the economy is very much still uh, a risk, um, inflation is, is, is so bad that you know, it's affecting ordinary Brazilians the most and the poor the most. People are you know, getting their paychecks and rushing to the supermarket to buy things before the prices go up. Um, and it's maybe starting to slow a little bit, but there's no kind of guarantee that it'll be able to stop at this point because inflation sometimes starts to sort of take off and feed on itself. Um, the, the next moment that I would mention are these uh, protests back in September. So I'm kind of going backwards here. Bear with me. Um, protests on September 6th that Bolsonaro um, attended and that were called by his supporters basically uh, to defend freedom of expression and uh, you know defend the vote count. And at this point, they were really kind of drumming this narrative of the need for uh, paper ballots um, because you know, one thing that Bolsonaro has been saying all along and has especially been saying as his popularity has been kind of dipping because of the economic situation and the inflation and um, people starting to get angry about the fact that his kind of trade-off that we're going to favor the economy instead of worrying about the health situation and in the long run that's going to pay off, people have started to realize, wait a minute, that's not really working. Why didn't you get you know, vaccines, maybe we could have been in a better position if you had. People, you know, you start to see his poll ratings really going down. And um, so in this context, these big protests are called in which Bolsonaro says, um, you know, unless we get these paper ballots, the electronic voting system could be compromised. And the Supreme Court is, you know, overstepping left and right uh, in trying to, uh, you know, um, arrest people who it seems were plotting some sort of a demonstration and you know to spare you all of the details these protests happened and people got really worried this was the kind of thing where um you know people were talking a lot about january 6th there were comparisons to you know is this the kind of um prologue to an eventual moment where Bolsonaro questions the results of the election if he loses? And would things turn out the same way in Brazil as they turned out in the US on January 6th, where you know, the Capitol Police came in? Things were violent, lives were lost, but basically democracy was preserved and, and you know, things got under control. And there have been questions here in Brazil because there was a military dictatorship not that long ago, because the police are, you know, in a large part supporters of Bolsonaro. And because there is this sort of sense, and we can kind of talk about this as, as we go on, that institutions are not as strong in Brazil as they are in the US. Um, and so, you know, I think what ended up happening was, was sort of telling. Um, in the end, there wasn't any kind of a, a, a coup or an institutional crisis. Um, the police mostly did their job. Uh, protesters went out there and, you know, waved their banners and Bolsonaro went and he gave a speech um, and and then, you know, life went on. Um, I think, I mean, at this point, I think there is still a kind of a fear of what happens if Bolsonaro loses, especially if it's close. Um, but my sense in talking to people is that the fears of a kind of a, a massive institutional crisis have gone down. And I think that's partly because Bolsonaro was so unpopular that it would be a much bigger risk for, for the military or for you know, some part of the military and or for some part of the police to go out on a limb to support um, this guy that at this point you know, is looking at uh, approval ratings in, in, in the mid twenties or low twenties. Um, I mean, I guess the other thing to think about going forward in the election is now Lula who before had pretty much rejection ratings right, as, right up as high as Bolsonaro. And that's a big reason why Bolsonaro's in here in the first place. You've seen him become sort of more palatable to people. It seems like his kind of strategy of reminding people of how good things were in the early 2000s when he was president is, you know, is sort of working. But on the other hand, he has kind of taken a, uh, he's not um, going out there every day into the streets. He's not launched his full campaign yet. And a big question that I have going forward is, 
know, what role does corruption play in this election? Um, it was the issue in the election in 2018. Um, it hasn't been the issue so far in the kind of lead up to the campaign, but uh, you know, when it comes to Lula, this is the, the single thing that most people are the most angry about. And I, and I find it hard to believe that people that, you know, that the majority of, of Brazilians have just kind of let go of that anger. And so I suspect that, um, you know, despite what the polls say right now, that there is going to be a kind of a reckoning with uh, Lava Jato and what role Lula had in Lava Jato, even if it wasn't the exact role that, you know, the, the Lava Jato investigators and Sergio Moro um, said that he had, you know, what was it? And is there a way that, you know, Brazilians can kind of be okay with that? Is he going to address it somehow? Um, those are questions that, you know, that I think a lot of people have. Um, and I guess finally, the last thing that I would bring up is the the International Climate Conference in Glasgow in, um, I think, you know, in October. And it was actually really interesting, Brazil's kind of role in this international setting because Brazil has of course become the villain on the international stage over the past few years. Um, went from being you know, a real kind of hero, reduced deforestation, hosted the Rio climate conference in the 90s, um, and then totally flipped and became the villain. The forests are burning. Bolsonaro doesn't seem to care at all, isn't doing the bare minimum to, to start to get a hold of the problem. But what you saw at the at the climate conference was a, a kind of a different a different stance. Um, you saw negotiators suddenly being more flexible on some of the things that they've been stubborn on in the past, including uh, Article Six, which is this sort of fascinating but complicated um, way by which countries that have a lot of um, forests and are able to use that forest to generate kind of carbon reducing product, carbon reducing projects can then sell those carbon credits to other countries who need to buy them. And Brazil had been sort of blocking this for a while because it wanted to count them differently. But in this case, you know, took a stance that was more um, useful to the, you know, to reach an accord. And also Brazil made a, a bigger commitment on reducing its emissions. I would say though, that here there's a real disconnect between what their kind of discourse was uh, and what the reality is. So in the, you know, in the coming weeks and months, the main headlines coming from reporters who are going to the Amazon or environmental defenders were of um, you know, really massive invasions of gold, illegal gold miners on the Yanomami indigenous reserve of you know, a family of, of turtle raisers being killed, uh, murdered for their work defending uh, land in another environmental reserve. And, um, and so I think there's a real kind of question here and, and here I want to sort of push the ball forward because I think um, you know the next president whoever he is whether it's uh, Bolsonaro who's trying hard to kind of pull back and get onto a more environmentally friendly uh, ground which to me seems very unlikely but or if it's Lula who's kind of coming into a Brazil that's very different than the one that he governed in the early 2000s some of this deforestation system that started is going to be very hard to undo, even if kind of the intention is there. Um, and I mean, I guess two things that are will help. A is, is Brazil is very keen on being in the OECD. Um, and one of the things that the OECD, which is this sort of, we call it in the economy, we call it a club of rich countries, um, but it's a kind of environmental um, club or, or, or you know, um, society that, that provides kind of benefits to the countries that are in it. And uh, Brazil is, you know, wanting to become a part of this club. But one of the things the OECD has said in, in accepting its application just this week is um, you really need to get a handle on this whole deforestation thing. And then the other thing that I think has changed, especially just in the past couple of years, is that the private sector here in Brazil has really realized the extent to which uh, deforestation is a risk. Um, not just to Brazil's image, but actually to its economy and um, trade. And, and so the private sector has really started to kind of make demands on the government that it wasn't making before. So far, those demands are, are still kind of weak and, you know, have some greenwashing. And, and, but I think, um, I think kind of going forward there, you know, this issue of the environment and deforestation is going to be incredibly important. And I don't think a change of government is going to sort of solve it. Um, so yeah, back to this question, is Brazil on the brink? Um, 
I would argue that Brazil has been pulled back a bit from the brink from where it was in June when you had, uh, you know, 3,000 people dying a day from COVID, when you had this sort of really nasty uh, back and forth between Bolsonaro and the Supreme Court and, you know, comments about um, him being able to overturn lockdown orders with, you know, with the support of the military and uh, at the same time, um, the congressional uh, investigation into the handling of the COVID pandemic was starting to really reveal some pretty scandalous stuff. There was a feeling of tensions were really high. I think that some of that has eased. But on the other hand, um, I think that the, you know, the economy and the economic situation that people have started to realize that this isn't something that's just going to go away. This is going to stick around. Inflation is here for a while. And that so maybe Brazil has been pulled back from, from the edge or from the brink. But um, as you know, a lot of Brazil hands who've been studying this country or reporting on this country for many, many years have said, you know, Brazil is kind of always in this position of never quite being um, taking off or being in a position of success, but also never quite being in, you know, totally headed for failure. Brazil never completely soars, it never com completely spirals. Um, but, uh, you know, I think uh, to anyone who has picked up a magazine, it, it's probably fairly obvious why we went with Brazil on the brink instead of Brazil below its potential as always, or Brazil so lackluster, or Brazil, you know, boring. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of you know fascinating things that have happened in Brazil. I think there there are a lot of reasons to justify that that title, Brazil on the brink. Um, including the hundreds of thousands of people who lost their lives in this pandemic, um, many of them unnecessarily because of the delay to get vaccines. And, and for people who are now suffering from you know, hunger and uh, for the worry that this kind of state of being near the brink will become uh, an epidemic rather than um, you know, something that Brazil is worried about and stuck in for a little while and then manages to overcome. Thanks so much, Sarah. I think that's a great introduction to the discussion. And before we enter into the proper, uh, proper uh, Q&A, and uh, I just want to, to bring a slide here that I think is a good example of uh, how, how the economist has, has, uh, has talked about Brazil over the years, right? Uh, at, the, at the height of the commodities boom in 2009, uh, Brazil was one of the, uh, of the big stars uh, in the national community. Uh, it was growing uh, while the, uh, most of the countries were still suffering from, from the backlash of the financial crisis and things have gone down the hill since then. I think what, one of the things that stand out uh, through those uh, cover pages is that, uh, it looks like the, the economist has been uh, either uh, over bullish or even over bearish about Brazil. And uh, is it possible for a country to change so much in such a uh, so short uh, time frame? Um, so there's a sort of a, a joke about economist covers that um, that goes around investors that basically you should do exactly the opposite of whatever the economist cover says because the covers are good for the short term and in the long term you should bet against them. Um, I don't know whether that's true. Uh, but I think, I mean, I think it's a question of sort of time scales as well. And, and journalism, weekly journalism is, you know, is happening on a very accelerated time scale. Um, that said, for this special report, you know, we did really try and kind of go back and and look at uh, look at the last decade. And, um, you know, I think we were able to be fair about uh, you know, about what worked and what didn't. And, um, and you know, I, I think, is there a danger in being overly, uh, overly optimistic or overly pessimistic? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think partly what journalism does is also kind of reflects where a society is in the way that it sees itself. And, and so I would say that kind of the economists didn't create these narratives, that the, you know, the feeling that Brazil was 
um, really taking off and was kind of coming in, you know, to a, a, a stronger and higher place in the international order was a feeling that was really shared kind of all around. And, um, and so I think, you know, yes, there should always be, there should always be skepticism. And I have a feeling if you, if you read, you know, if you read the pages of the reports of each of these covers that you would find some of that skepticism in there. Um, but I also think that part of what, you know, what, what uh, a magazine like ours is, a weekly magazine is trying to do in, in, you know, in the image that it, that it puts um, on the newsstands is to capture the, you know, the sentiment of a place uh, at a given time in history. And, um, and I think that the covers have done that. Excellent. And uh, from the short run to the long run, as we know, Brazil turns 200 years this year, and there are 200 years of us, we're celebrating 200 years of um, independence. And uh, as an observer of the Brazilian society, uh, as an observer who's, uh, who, who is in the country, right? What do you think um, we should be celebrating and what we should be regretting? Oh, wow. Um, what an interesting question. Um, I think, well, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, Brazil is, it is a democracy. It is a massive and um, a complicated democracy, but it is, you know, to me, it's kind of incredible that, um, you know, for example, the health system, that there's a health system that you can go to in a tiny outpost in the Amazon and, um, yes, maybe there's not the right kind of medicine. It takes a while to get seen, so on and so forth, but that place exists and is part of the very same health system that I could go to an outpost in here in Sao Paulo and, um, you know, the infrastructure for, for, uh, a, a kind of continental sized democracy um, and one that has tried very hard to build a strong safety net, I think is worth celebrating. It has fallen short in a lot of ways, both on the, on the safety net and on, on, you know, on democracy. Um, but you know, what country hasn't? Um, I'm American, I'm from the U S and uh, I could, I could easily, you know, cite a long list of the ways that the American democracy and, and social safety net have, have fallen short. Um, I mean, I think another thing that's kind of interesting, just looking at this year in particular, is that this year also is um, Brazil is going to be reconsidering its, um, its quota policy for uh, universities, and this is a, you know, thinking of things that the U.S. has been thinking about a lot and that Brazil has as well. This one's on my mind, um, and this is quotas for, uh, for Black Brazilian Indigenous students at um, federal universities uh, in Brazil, and it's been around now, I think, for, for a decade. Um, since 2012, it was made official, um, and I mean, I think one thing that's always been very interesting to me is that, that, that Brazil has um, really complicated race relations and understanding of how race works. And it's, you know, there's some things that has in common with the US, black Brazilians die at the hands of the police uh, in you know, much bigger proportion than they do in the US and, and, and you know, many more numbers in, in general because it's so much more violent here. Um, but I also think that um, you know, it was very interesting for me to kind of try to sort of understand this uh, from, you know, both from, from, from kind of a Brazilian perspective, rather than putting my American hat on, um, and, and to get past what, you know, this sort of notion here in Brazil uh, of a racial democracy. And, you know, Brazil is a, a really diverse and interesting country where people have, um, you know, more mixed marriages than they do in the U.S., but that has led to this kind of, um, I think, uh, myth that Brazil, you know, Brazil doesn't have a problem with racism and that the problems that you see with uh, police killings and, um, you know, a lot of discrimination and so on and so forth are more about poverty than they are about race. Um, so that's another thing I think, you know, I think that, Br that Brazil um, has, uh, what was it, I mean, celebrate and, um, and regret. regret. I think it's a, yeah, it's, it's a regret or it's something to, um, you know, that, that I think Brazil needs, still needs to reckon with. Um, well, and I mean, the special report gets into kind of some sort of 
chunky economic stuff as in Brazil had this real opportunity with the commodities boom where it could have um, made more kind of investments in 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 things that would fuel long-term growth uh, including you know kind of better education and um, some you know ways to reform business and and the way that the tax system works and and make it a more kind of um, uh, a more progressive and, and equal system rather than one that favors uh, certain sectors of the population and especially big kind of companies, um, what Dilma Rousseff called the, the Brazilian champions. Um, so I think that there's sort of a, you know, this chunk of Brazil's history when we had this cover of the Christ statue taking off that, um, you know, Brazil was doing a lot of really amazing things and, and here going back to celebrating Brazil did reduce poverty. The Bolsa Familia program was incredibly important. Um, there were, you know, a lot of kind of progressive gains on social issues. Uh, education did kind of become more open to people from um, from uh, different races and, and lower classes and different areas of the country. All of those are really good things. But I think that um, sometimes in celebrating those things, people kind of com conform and, and don't um, realize that it could have been, you know, much more could have been done during this period. Um, that was what I focused on the special report, but um, yeah, just bits and pieces. Excellent. And last question before we uh, we close this live transmission and have the students asking questions on a more private context. Uh, the next cover of The Economist, do you expect something more positive? Ooh. Um... That's a good question. I, I would like to be surprised. I think the journalists are um, inherently pessimistic. And so I guess my, my gut answer is I don't, I don't see it in the, you know, in the very near future. And I'm, I'm very keen to get a Brazil on the cover again in the near future, but who knows? This is a year where Brazil could see a lot of change, and um, and so I hope that you know I hope that there is reason to have a more positive cover. Um, although maybe if if I were to follow your advice, it would be neither a completely positive or completely negative cover. Um, I, I'm going to have to think about how to kind of make an appealing cover that is neither too positive nor too negative. All right. Thanks so much, Sarah, and. Uh... Now we're going to 